operations. And, and the idea is to, to ramp up over the two to three years of the intervention to be more explicit about some of these ideas, but to start out pretty, um, pretty indirect in terms of just getting the conversation started that girls and boys are, are similar. Um, here's just another example where they're uh, you know, using a comic book that's talking about sexual harassment of, of girls. I'll, I'll, in the interest of time, not say too much about that. So the, just to conclude, boy, both boys and girls uh, and mothers and fathers in, ha in Haryana state attitudes that are unfavorable to girls. So there's variation. You know, as I said, girls are more progressive, but it's still not where we would want them to be. Uh, and this is about fewer opportunities, less autonomy uh, in adulthood. Uh, girls are more progressive than boys, and, but mothers aren't than fathers, and uh, mothers are, are influential in changing, changing the, uh, affecting their kids' attitudes. So you know, there's some evidence from these peer effects that other influences outside the home matter, the school environment matters, and so the hope is that this breakthrough intervention, I don't think we think it's uh, gonna be a panacea, but we do think it can have an appreciable effect on, on these attitudes, and in turn, later behaviors of, of this generation. So, Stay tuned for uh, our impact evaluation results on the intervention in a couple of years. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much, Dr. Jay Chandran. Uh, I'm sure there are quite a few questions uh, to be raised and for discussion, but we also have an eminent expert uh, who agreed to be a discussion here. And before I request her, uh, I thought of making one or two very quick observations, not really a summary, uh, it's a very, very interesting study that we have on a very important topic. Um, and uh, I do not know why the state of Haryana was chosen, where generally it is believed that gender attitudes are very strong, and strongly in this uh, And which means that perhaps we cannot simply generalize the findings as uh, applicable to all, all over India. But I think many of the conclusions are quite important and uh, could be well received that gender attitudes are very strong. They also vary, uh, vary between several types of families. <clears throat> and obviously, they are influenced by a very set, large set of factors, cultural, social, economic. And, uh, uh, and also, they are also influenced by their own parents' uh, parents' attitudes. Uh, children's attitudes are also influenced by their parents' attitudes quite significantly. That's an important finding that you have made. Uh, and they also, mother's effects are much stronger than father's, uh, father's attitudes, uh, which also have a lot of policy implications for further development. Children's aspirations for education, for job, for many other activities are highly influenced by the parental attitudes. Uh, parental effects are also, of course, not common because they also vary between mother and father significantly. One particular issue that I thought, uh, given the title of the paper, Intergenerational Transmission, <laughs> You would all, I thought uh, the authors would also comment upon uh, how, how the attitudes are changing. I mean, the, change, the attitudes of the parents versus the attitudes of the children, how progressive they are. Are they pretty progressive, or they are as good or as bad as their, their parents? And uh, I, I couldn't find uh, exactly uh, any answer to that particular question. I might have missed it. Uh, anyway, I think it's a very, very interesting paper, and uh, I now I'd like to request uh, Professor Ratna Sudarshan uh, to offer her comments on the paper. Professor Ratna Sudarshan is my distinguished colleague at the National University of Educational Planning and Administration, where she serves as a national fellow and uh, has done quite a bit of serious work on education, gender equality, and social change. Uh, she was the director of the Institute of Social Studies Trust in New Delhi, uh, before which she worked for a very long period in the National Council for Applied Economic Research. Uh, she was also a member of the working group of feminist economists set up by the Planning Commission for the 11th and 12th five-year plans. She holds an MA economics from the Delhi School of Economics and MSc in economics from the University of Cambridge. Now, may I request Dr. Sudarshan to offer the comments? Yes, please. So thank you very much. Uh, I'd I'd really like to thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity to read very carefully two really interesting papers and reflect a bit on the very important policy questions that they raise. Um, so first of all, I'd really just like to compliment you on doing something that I think is extremely important. 
uh, which is to think more seriously about what it is that shapes gender attitudes in our society. Uh, that this this paper, this study is looking quite uh, you know is is um, interesting for uh, uh, or let, let me I mean you know to what extent um, I mean it's it has a very very difficult objective at the end of it because if you're trying to change attitudes to you know change such outcomes as sex selective abortion that's really setting our sights quite high mm -hmm. uh, so that need not I think uh, you know take away from the endeavor but I think it's important to remember that it's even if we see small changes uh, those should be noted as being very important. So how we judge the success of this intervention, I think we need to think quite carefully about what we see as um, you know, realistic change over a short period of time. And what, uh, you know, what, so, so the time frame is something that perhaps needs a little bit more thought. Now, I just have a few um, small comments, so I'll just um, go over those. Uh, Two of the questions that I made in the out, at the outset, uh, I, I think, are worth discussing a little more or substantiating a little more. Uh, the first statement, which is made in the paper, is that secondary school students are mature enough that they can discuss gender issues. Now, in the context of a state like Haryana, I would really question whether 11 to 13 year olds have this maturity, and what that really means, because undoubtedly this is a correct age at which to you know, begin a conversation about sex and gender, but this is not a conversation that is normally, it doesn't happen within most households. So the implication of that really is that it may, you know, we may need a lot of build up time before we actually get to a point where we are, um, you know, getting the real, uh, you know, sort of uh, getting to what the children think because, so, so again, it's really an issue of time and, uh, you know, at what point, ha so, so, so do we need a build up before we start assessing attitudes? Um, the, the second assumption is, is one that probably doesn't affect your study, but I thought it's worth, uh, worth drawing attention to, and that is the assumption that higher household wealth is associated with more progressive gender attitudes. This is not really fully established in the literature. There's I can just refer to one paper that uh, is a fairly recent paper by Sonaldi Desai using the India Human Development Survey data, where uh, she has, uh, it's titled Doing Gender Versus Doing Modernity. And in fact, her uh, analysis shows that uh, gender attitudes are actually more regressive, not progressive, as income goes up. So I'm sure one can you know, question some of the nitty gritty of that analysis, but it is also, uh, there's a lot of ethnographic literature which seems to suggest the same thing. So, as I said, this doesn't really affect your study, but it's just that since it, it, it's a point, you know, that it, it, it's a point that's mentioned, and I thought it's worth. Um, uh, so, it only affected your sample selection, and I think that's okay because the, it's quite clearly demonstrated by whatever evidence we have that the shift of boys to private schools is actually faster than the shift of girls, and I guess that's the relevant issue. Um, now, your analysis showed that peers influence gender equality attitudes as do parents, and the latter effect is stronger, uh, which is interesting. It's good to know. Uh, I guess it's also good to know that both are influential. So, again, the question would be uh, not for your intervention, but in general, whether we need a one, should we only work with schools or should we also be working on two or three fronts to help the cumulative change in attitudes. One, uh, one, one piece of data that I found very interesting is that if we look at the work participation, it, it actually seems to suggest that there's a lower parental pressure on girls regarding choice of occupation. Uh, and this, again, is something that uh, has also been reported in some other studies. Uh, so it's actually quite interesting because we are concerned about uh, a huge gap, gender gap in work participation rates and we do find a very large gender gap in work participation. But if parental attitudes, partly because girls are not part of labor market networks in the way that boys are, if parental attitudes allow girls greater choice, uh, we might, you know, as if there are more opportunities becoming available, 
you know, that's, that's an idea that's also uh, could be interesting to pursue. Uh, the real, the, my real, the, I mean, the, the point that I really want to emphasize is, is that I, I think there's very little evidence that attitudes directly translate into behavior, and particularly around gender. And that's really what I would, a thought that I would like to leave with you. It is something that uh, becomes relevant when you come to the end line and to assessing the process of change. And why do I say this? Uh, because if we, you know, if, if we look at, um, let me take work participation as an example. Uh, if we look at, uh, so there are a lot of studies that have probed into women's decisions around work. There's a study that we had done at the ISST, which is based on a sample survey in Delhi, but it collected a lot of narratives as well from women. Uh, there are also other studies, there's an analysis by uh, Basant Pradhan using NCAR data. And what these studies show is that it's really marriage or the attitudes in the situation of the marital family that determines work-related choices of women. Now, this does not mean, so you make, so women have certain attitudes and they, so there are a lot of women who may be working before marriage who will stop working subsequently. There are also women who are not working prior to marriage who start working later. So it is, it's interesting because this is very different from the situation in the, in the West. So if you look at Western literature, it suggests that it is the birth of children that influences women's work. In India, much more strongly, the effect is of marriage, and it's a much lower effect. Uh, in fact, there's hardly any effect of, of children. So if a woman is working, then the birth of children does not actually further bring down the work participation rate. So there is a difference in the, in the kind of context. No, but then beyond that, the argument is that it is not, it's not just attitudes uh, of the marital family, it is actually, uh, you know, so it's a complex situation where relationships are important. And so the decisions that you take are not, you know, so you may be very progressive in your gender attitude, but you may take a decision that is, that doesn't look progressive because, uh, you know, it appears to consolidate relationships that are of value. Now, how you translate this mathematically, I really do not know, but I would like to argue that there is essentially, this is a, it's a, it's a situation of complexity where the outcome is inherently uncertain. So it would be really interesting and useful for, I think, all of us to know what else, uh, you know, apart from the intervention that is, that is happening, what else is happening around people which appears to have an influence on behavior. And one thing certainly, I think, you know, we cannot stop at the age of 13. So and I know this is, this is making a, a comment that is way beyond, but, but really we need sustained intervention if attitudes are going to shift. And then what happens to attitudes and behavior, I think needs a lot more analysis. And so, you know, as I said, the, how you translate this mathematically is something, uh, you know, you, you would be able to tell us, but uh, not to see these as linear, uh, you know, uh, relationships, because very clearly they are not linear relationships. Right? Um, I think I will just stop there, and maybe we can have discussion. Thank you. Well, the, <laughs> it's a, it's a, the, the other point was, was about, you know, that it's, it's really, again, what you have said in your paper is your ultimate objective, which is to shift behavior around, uh, you know, around things like sex selective abortion. So we are really looking at many different intersecting systems that will need to change. We are looking for a kind of transformation. Um, so how do we model this change? How do we, you know, so it's not only changing gender attitudes of girls and boys, it's really about building collective capacity to shift this whole system. So as I said, these are, these are, these are things that uh, would be more relevant for your end line. But I think as we go forward to question some of the assumptions and to question the linearity of the change we're expecting, um, so that when you're comparing the baseline and the end line, some of this could come into play. So, 
Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Sudarshan. Now the paper is open for comments, questions from the floor. And I request you to introduce yourself and offer the observations very crisply so that we'll get more and more comments. And also there is some time for the for Dr. Jayachandran to respond to some of them at least. Yes, I find the first hand at the back. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, okay, this one. Yeah, your lady, and then I come to this too. Um, I have a question about the composition of the families. So you looked at kids' attitudes based on the peers and based on the parents. But do you think family composition matters? If most of the kids' siblings are boys, a uh, girl may be very different than in a family where most of the siblings are, are girls. Um, yeah. Thank you. Thank you for a very crisp question. Please. Hello, I am Sarath from Jammu. Actually, the your field is Haryana, and there is major problem is the social construction, uh, gender attitude, and how that social construction of gender attitude is playing with the secondary school children. I don't think so. And what's the role of the caste as such? Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, uh, firstly, congratulations on your study. Uh, I had a question in line with uh, the gentleman before me and Ms. Tilak's comment about the importance of the study in Haryana, especially to eliminate the effects of the study being held in the region or in those districts specifically. Maybe you would want to take a control sample of maybe student uh, families who are not enrolled in school because we can kind of think of enrollment in school as a measure of progress to some extent and maybe that would be an interesting measure to see if there are any changes in that respect. Thank you, thank you very much. Yes, yes sir. Uh, yeah, Sima, do you know anything about the dowry system in Haryana? I think uh, these economic traditions uh, affect the uh, gender attitudes a lot. Okay. Uh, Seema, uh, I was wondering, you talked about the implicit association test and you were thinking of redoing it, and I was just curious why. Is it because you want the IAT results to match with what they say in surveys? Or I'm not sure why, because I thought it's interesting to see the differences. It could be that there is so much social pressure to say what is considered the right thing, that women are not supposed to say that women should be unharmed. So I, I was not clear why you wanted to redo it, is it just to bring them into line, but I thought the difference should actually be interesting. 
Okay, you know, no, one more question from here. Uh, this side, please. Sir. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. I still find some more hands being raised. Uh, okay, that uh, one, two, very short questions, and that will, they will be the last questions. My name is Ganesh. I'm an India student. I have a question about, in a society, woman is not bored. She's manufactured, and the other name for it is the, the cultural exploitation and suppression. And to, to stop this crisis, we have to have a climatic response that we have said in North America and Europe. If we think the same here in India, what could be the possibilities and uh, what could be the constraints that you can face out of your survey? And uh, I repeat, the one-time collective response here in India is not new. We have seen after Jalindwarapa, Dalit movements and anti-corruption movements in the same time. Thank you. Thank you very much. And that will be the last question, please. <clears throat> Rather than a question, I just wanted to uh, add on um, um, my view. Uh, this is Shekhar from uh, Radio Action International South Asia, working on um, quality and access education. Uh, Seema, first of all, it's a breaking the wall of silence, uh, talking about this issue of gender. Uh, coming from recently from Bihar, where Mahathapul comes from, Bethia, West Chambar, we have a project back to basics. And uh, the girls, uh, there was a new New York intern came in 2013, and this is the, the, the phrase of 2013 for me in education. A group of girls coming to the intern from New York and saying, we are equal to the boys. And that was the most powerful statement I heard in, in especially Bihar education after one, in one year. It may be a simple statement, but actually there is a lot to uh, uh, attach to it, especially the IGC work in Bihar, Cycle Mukimantri, Mukimantri Cycle Yoshna, although Mr. Niti is no more there. But the attitude is changing uh, on various, uh, you know, by putting, and these are the first generation learners, especially the girls. I was reading the last night article, uh, Ashok Kothwal's, how the challenge in the aspirations of the Indians and how the UK government has paid and eventually that is the watershed elections. So yes, I mean, I think, I think uh, uh, we need to invest more time and resources to capture uh, these kind of additional changes not beyond Haryana and across the board. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I think, uh, I do not know. We have very, very tough time. <clears throat> and uh, we also have another paper to be presented in the session before we break for lunch and discuss the paper before we break for lunch. Well, so I request Dr. Jayachandran to take as yeah. less time as possible, something like three to, five minutes, speed. Yeah. three to uh, five minutes to respond to some of the important issues that were raised and defer some questions for discussion during lunchtime.
So thank you very much, uh, Mr. Darshan, for the comments. That was they were very helpful, and I agree with um, you know many of the comments and, and sort of. Uh, caveats to what we can expect. So, I mean, first of all, I, I want to say that we don't have grand ambitions to eliminate, create a, a balanced sex ratio, or um, have have really large effects in terms of eliminating this problem. I think part of the view is that this, when we think about trying something and seeing if this approach works, then you can think about scaling it up. Or even if you don't scale it up, the costs of this intervention, if it were just part of a curriculum, are small. So, you know, it might still be. Uh, beneficial, but but I think in terms of you know, what we would consider successful, I think I would personally consider it a success if we see some impact on attitudes. We don't see it on behavior, but that's enough to convince the government to try to start this at earlier ages, continue it to later ages, you know, sort of embed it, and try something bigger. So we, as researchers and Breakthrough as an NGO that's trying to raise funds, can't do something large scale, and um, so this is at least a starting point to, to see if this method works. You know, and, and why Haryana? This was a conversation with the government of Haryana, where I think we came in as skeptics, even as the economists, of this idea of giving financial incentives. So you know, we're trying to push them for a, a, to try a different approach. Um, I think there were a lot of questions, TNs, this question about, you know, is this, can, can you, will attitudes translate to behavior? Even Ashok's question is, you know, like we, I think, to, to, to put in a little bit of math, I, I sort of think that having your own aspirations, your own attitudes might be a necessary condition to, Act differently later, but it's certainly not a sufficient condition. And and you know, so I think part of it is changing the attitudes of boys because maybe they will they might not be able to change their parents' attitudes, but in that marital home maybe they will defend defend their wife uh, a little bit. But even that might might not be sufficient. And so I, I you know I don't think we know the answer whether our, our hypothesis is that you can have some small impact by changing this one dimension, even though there are many constraints. There are constraints of family members, there are the constraints of the Kap Panchayat, there are some economic concerns like dowry. And so one view would be you need a big coordination. You need to change all of these at the same time, really enforce bans on dowry, um, try to change parents' attitudes, et cetera, enforce no early marriage, and change kids' attitudes. Oh, we are certainly not doing something that's coordinated, and it's the idea that you can make incremental change, you know, so small, but that changing, moving one dimension starts to chip at the problem, and and you know, hopefully there are parallel activities. You know, in terms of what uh, breakthrough intervention is, it's also trying to have the kids start a conversation with their parents. So that's one other dimension, you know, and they have other work working in the community. So we're focusing on the school base, but I think I think we all acknowledge that you know, ultimately you want to try to push on many fronts to, to change attitudes so that because I as an individual might have all the best intentions, but if my family won't let me do something or there's peer pressure or there are financial reasons, um, my preferences are not gonna translate into um, to behavior. So the, uh, in terms of the, you know, so our 11 to 13 year olds, uh, too young, you know, I, I think I agree that, that uh, you know, on the one hand, young, younger, People might have more malleable attitudes. On the other hand, as you get older, you're more comfortable talking about these issues. So I think our idea would be that this would continue. Uh, I don't know that you could start it much earlier, just at least the government might not be so keen on that and parents, but certainly continuing beyond that. Um, you know, in terms of uh, wealth and gender attitudes, I agree, and I've seen a, a lot of this research. I guess I was just making a statement in our sample, and it's you know, Haryana and a certain wealth range, it is, uh, we do find systematically that the wealthier families in this context have more progressive attitudes. It'd be interesting to see why that is different from, from other, um, other settings in India. Uh, the, uh, in terms of the, Victoria's comment about family composition, one thing we haven't done, but we've heard anecdotally and we should look at in the data is that people say their older siblings are influential. Uh, so one thing is to think, you know, maybe parents are less influential when somebody is a is a younger child rather than a, a an older um, child. And and uh, yeah, so I mean, I'll just kind of summarize. I'll, I'll end with Lakshmi's question, but just to sort of I think summarize is that this is a hard problem. You know, I don't know that breakthrough knows the answer. Uh, I don't think. Uh, we know. We, I don't think the best attitude change program in a curriculum can make a. Uh, eradicate the problem, but in sort of, if I look 
this project, I, I use these anecdotes of my childhood, and like thinking about these major changes in people's progressive attitudes, they probably weren't by through just legal changes or financial incentives. Somehow you make people think it's, understand that it's a human rights issue, that this is wrong. And, and schools and seem like a good venue to, to try to crack that nut. And, and so I think we're hopeful that we'll be able to see some change in attitude to, to motivate a bigger effort and possibly to see behavior change, small behavior change, even within um, this sample. So to Lakshmi's uh, comment about the IIT, I agree. You know, on the one hand, it's like you know, maybe this is telling us that there's social pressure to say you like boys, but you really like girls. I think our just concern is, is I, I, I described it as this, are we just picking up that 11-year-old girls think boys are icky? You know, like it's, it's with kids, it's, we have pictures of their same age, and so it's hard. I think what we want to get is attitudes towards, would you rather have a son than a daughter? Would you, do you think women are more competent than men? And so which kids you like playing with? might be different. And so I think, I don't know that we'll eliminate the, what we did before. I just think there are probably different dimensions of gender attitudes of, you know, uh, who do you like being around is different from, you know, and we see this in our survey data, that, like lots of people want daughters, you know, they want a son for instrumental reasons of prestige and someone to inherit the land and someone to take care of them in old age. But, you know, other than that, they like having girls around. They're kind of easier to raise, et cetera. And so I think it's this distinction between some of these instrumental reasons for wanting boys, which I think are probably what's driving behavior, and then you know, general affect about girls and boys. And, and I think we picked up that general affect, and that might not be as predictive of behaviors that, that we want to ultimately change. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Jay Chandran. And let's give a big applause to her. <laughs> she has uh, heeded to the advice of keeping some questions for discussion during lunchtime. Thank you. <clears throat> now, we have another paper, another very interesting paper to be made, uh, to be presented here, uh, authored by two uh, scholars. One, Dr. Mahatabul Hazam Azam, who is an assistant professor of economics at the Oklahoma University and a research fellow at the Institute for the Study of Labor. Uh, he got his PhD in economics from Southern Methodist University, MA, and MA, before that MA in economics from Delhi School of Economics. He's primarily interested in the fields of labor and development, development economics, and uh, he's interested in topics like skills, education, mobility, poverty, social protection, program evaluation, and then so on and so on. <coughs> Um, the joint author is Professor Gita, Gita Gandhi Kingdom, uh, who is a professor of education at the Institute of International Development at the Institute of Education in London University, uh, who was uh, in the Oxford University, University of Oxford, Department of Economics, as a research fellow for a very long period before going to the London University. Uh, she got the PhD from Oxford University and lectured in development economics. And she also has very wide interests, including economics of education, labor economics, and economics of happiness. Now, uh, we have something like 35 to 40 minutes between both of them to make the presentation. Uh, certainly, 20 minutes, 20 minutes will not add to 40. That's what we agreed upon. And we start with Gita, who will make a presentation of the first part, and it will be followed by uh, Dr. Assam. Yeah. Okay, thanks very much. <clears throat> Could be happy. Thanks very much to the IGC and ISI for the opportunity to present our paper, uh, Assessing Teacher Quality in India. This is a double act. It's going to be myself and Mehta presenting this together. Now, am I getting this right? Am I pressing that? Do I get the next one? Is it pressing that? So, you know, in this forum, we don't need to make the case for uh, improving uh, educational achievement of children. There's quite a lot of research showing all the major, major economic and social benefits of uh, enhanced educational achievement. But the trillion dollar question in the education sector is how to improve educational outcomes of children within schools. And that is an extremely important policy relevant question too. The kinds of ideas that have been explored and in fact even legislated are to do with, for instance, reducing class sizes and the Right to Education Act in India uh, emphasizes that, uh, mandates that. Uh, 
extremely expensive policy, but uh, implemented. Uh, another idea is to increase skill, school inputs and the whole range of school inputs, including teacher-related inputs. And um, that has also been mandated in the Right to Education Act of India, recently enacted in 2010, uh, or at least implemented in 2010, enacted in 2009. Then uh, there's a whole range of policies to do with improving the incentives for teachers, for example, the in, uh, bringing together of a performance-related pay to try and improve teacher effort. Uh, those policies are typically resisted by teacher unions, so they've not been mandated, but uh, they have been, their efficacy has been uh, researched and found to be, I mean, they've been found to be efficacious, particularly a paper by Karthik Murli Dharan based on data from uh, uh, Karnataka. And then uh, uh, the whole issue of teacher quality and improving of teacher quality. And again, the Right to Education Act seeks to do that in India through making it, uh, impo uh, m making it uh, laying down minimum qualifications requirements for, for teachers and making teacher training compulsory. The importance of teacher quality in determining in student achievement is, is increasingly realized and also you know, uh, recognized in public policy. For example, in the US, the No Child Left Behind uh, policies uh, are focus on identifying teacher quality, measuring teacher quality, because of the recognition of the importance of that for student achievement. Similarly, in India, the Ministry of Human Resource Development has policies on teacher certification. But the big question here is, does higher teacher certification actually raise student achievement? What is the evidence on that? And it is useful to know which particular teacher characteristics raise achievement. If, if we can get to that, then we can recruit teachers based on those characteristics, we can reward and compensate teachers based on those, and we can have more efficient outcomes in the education sector. Until now, the literature has examined the relationship between teacher quality and student achievement very directly in a kind of a regression format and a kind of an achievement production function uh, uh, rubric. And um, starting from Coleman, you know, in the late 1960s, using very simple kitchen sink type um, regression analysis where you put in teacher characteristics on the right-hand side of a student achievement regression, um, to more, much more recently, the use of experimental methods, uh, the use of panel data approaches, and the use of instrumental variables-based approaches. However, the interpretation of such uh, papers, such results, is contested. So the question remains, what is a good teacher? How do we define teacher quality? A novel definition based on outcomes produced by a teacher rather than based on the inputs into a teacher. So for instance, at the moment, how do we identify who is a good teacher? We identify a good teacher by, uh, you know, at the point of recruitment, how do we identify which applicants we will take? We look at their uh, certification, whether they have a grade 12 degree, whether they have a BA degree, whether they have an MA degree. So teacher qualifications, we look at that. We look at whether they have teacher training, whether they have a BTC, uh, you know, basic teaching certificate, whether they have a BA, whether they have an MA, uh, Masters of Educational um, Education. And we may look at other uh, characteristics, such as how many years the teacher has worked already, what is the number of years of experience. So these are what you might call inputs into a teacher, the characteristics of a teacher cognitive achievement levels as measured by literacy and numeracy uh, skills uh, measured in tests, standardized tests, like those of the ASER and in other ways. We know that India took part in uh, the uh, sort of the extended cycle of PISA in 2009, which is the OECD standard test. I think 74 countries took this test, 74 countries or regions within countries took this test. And uh, Himachal Pradesh and Tamil Nadu, the two educationally considered to be advanced states of India, educationally advanced states of India, uh, the Ministry of Human Resource Development allowed these two states to take part in this test. And unfortunately, India came 73rd out of 74 in, in terms of you know, the, 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 the position uh, you know, in, the, in the international league table, as it were. Das, and uh, this is Jishnu Das and Zhang, um, used results from standardized maths tests from the TIMS, the Trends in Mathematics and Science Study, which is, uh, I think, taken by 55 countries. And two states of India, Odisha and Rajasthan, were permitted to, uh, to be tested based on items that were based on the TIMS tests. And again, the, although the performance of a small number of children was quite good in international uh, terms, the performance of, of the overwhelming proportion of children from these two states was uh, at the bottom of the global rankings. 
there's increasing evidence in the US that teachers play a key role in improving student achievement. However, in a developed country context, the question remains unanswered. How much does a teacher or can a teacher increase student achievement? And as far as we know, there is no work in India or on any other developing country on the question of you know, teacher quality and effectiveness as measured by a teacher's ability to raise test scores. So using this novel definition, this outcomes-based definition of teacher quality. And our paper is an attempt to provide what we think might be the first evidence from a developing country on this issue. The literature on this, in this area has mainly come from the US, with some of the important papers being that by Rockoff in American Economic Review in 2004, which was based on two school districts in New Jersey, uh, Hanusha et al., uh, one large district in Texas, Aronson et al., Chicago Public High Schools. Now, this, this was the only study out of the four that we've listed, these four important studies. Um, this was the only study that based on uh, sort of students of secondary school age, uh, grade nine. And then Rifkin et al. used data from 3,000 schools from Texas, but all the other three studies are based on elementary school children. The United States studies find considerable variation in teacher effectiveness. So they find, so if you, if you take an average across these studies, so there's a meta-analysis of such studies that's been done. We've listed four, but there are some others as well. If you were to take the average uh, of uh, the, the findings from uh, across this uh, type of study, it find that, finds that a one standard deviation increase in teacher quality raises children's reading scores by an average of 0.13 standard deviations. And if we look at the, you know, the study that has the highest uh, teacher quality impact, uh, it's 0.18 standard deviations, and the lowest is 0.07 standard deviations. And when it comes to maths, we find that a one standard deviation increase in teacher quality raises children's maths score by an average of 0.17 standard deviation, and it varies from about 0.11 to about 0.27 standard deviations. So, uh, you know, quite reasonably large sized effects from teacher quality onto student achievement. Um, outside of the US, the literature is very limited. Uh, we have come across two papers. One is by Burgess et al. for the United Kingdom. And that's kind of quite similar to our paper because again, it is, this is uh, one of the very few papers that is based on secondary uh, data from secondary education. And Lee has a paper based on Australia, again, on elementary education. So our paper provides what we think is the first estimates of teacher effectiveness in India, or uh, as far as we know, in a developing country. And it's the only, uh, only the second paper that we are aware of that examines sec senior secondary school teachers. What we do is that we take board exam results of students in grade 10 and in grade 12. These are the high stakes board exams. And we estimate teacher value added. So these are high stakes tests because they matter for later you know, entrance to college and university. So they are taken seriously by the students, their families, and by teachers. And they are both externally set and externally graded. And you know, unlike most of the studies in this area, uh, we are able to use uh, teacher value added rather than uh, levels of achievement. So because we are able to control for prior achievement of children in grade 10. Um, our data is purely administrative data. And this type of data is, of course, much easier to implement in a more scaled up way. So for example, this type of data is very easily available. Um, exam boards regularly collect data on student achievement at grade 10 and grade 12. It could be easily linked to the teachers in the respective schools. And so, so this, this methodology that we follow uh, can easily be replicated, um, providing data uh, is made available. And what, we, what our paper does is, is, is the findings of the paper are actually quite similar to the findings that have been um, seen in US studies and the UK study and in the Australian study, and which serves to increase the confidence in the findings of these other studies as if the the, the, the general finding is very, is common, it's as if it's a universal, uh, you know, universally applicable phenomenon, uh, what we find. Um, so basically what we find is that teacher quality varies enormously uh, within the school system, and that uh, individual teachers make a lot of difference to student outcomes. Moreover, we find that the size of the effect is quite large, 
possibly significantly larger in our developing country context compared to a uh, developed country context. And lastly, and very importantly, the findings from the conventional literature, which I alluded to earlier, which is an inputs-based, which uses an inputs-based approach to measuring teacher quality, uh, which, which actually finds that there is no effect, no consistent effect from uh, you know, teacher characteristics on the one hand onto student achievement on the other. That this finding is also corroborated when we approach the same question from a very different angle based on an outcomes-based measure of teacher quality. In other words, when we measure teacher quality as a teacher fixed effect, okay, and we then use that as our measure of teacher quality, if we then regress that teacher fixed effect on, on um, teacher characteristics, observed teacher characteristics, we find that there is uh, these teach observed teacher characteristics like certification, experience, um, these characteristics have no uh, strong correlation with the uh, with our measure of teacher quality which raises the big policy question of you know how do we measure teacher quality in a way that we can then reliably recruit teachers who are of good quality and reward teachers on the basis of the actual outcomes that they are producing so i'll hand over now to mehtab data basically comes from administrative <coughs> administrative records provided by a group of private <coughs> school from one of the district in Uttar Pradesh. So we have information of, uh, about five cohorts from 2006 to 2010 who took 12 grade exam. We also know their 10 grade score in each subject. So each of the 10 schools have mul uh, multiple 12, <coughs> 12 sections. And we have 12th and 10th grade scores in multiple subjects. Then each student in match is, is matched to the teacher who taught for two years. Most of the cases, the same teacher is teaching the student for two years in class 11 and class 12, except few cases. So we know that 12th grade exams are typically taken at the age of 17, 18, and 10th is basically 15, 16. Both 12th and 10th grade exams are nationally set and marked outside the school, and they are high stake exams. Most importantly, <coughs> When you hire senior secondary teacher, they are supposed to teach a prescribed curriculum. So they are not in the overall development of the student. They are just there to teach a prescribed curriculum. So we have information on eight, about 8,000 students who took 12th grade, 12th grade exam between 2006 and 2010. The average number of subjects for which 12th grade scores are reported is 5.8. While the scores are reported for at least four subjects for 99% of the students. <clears throat> so basically, we can think about an observation as a student teacher match or equivalently a student subject teacher ma match. Can I just correct? On, on, on the first row, you yeah. should say 10th grade. So for 10th grade scores, uh, for 10th grade students, uh, we average number of subjects is nearly six. Yeah, five point eight. So basically, we can think about an observation being <coughs> as a student subject teacher because the same <coughs> each, each teacher is teaching only one specific subject. So there is no multiple subject teaching. <coughs> so we have information about 191 teachers, and median number of classroom observed per teacher is five, and an average class number of classroom observed is 6.8. <coughs> So the teacher value added basically checks education as a cumulative process. So whatever inputs you received at any stage of your schooling is contributing to your final achievement. <laughs> so we assume that there is a linear for, uh, form. So achievement in any grade is basically dependent on any kind of school inputs you received in any other grades previously. <laughs> individual inputs, family input, which is goes in X, and individual character, individual unobserved factors over time, or any kind of socks you have socks you observed over time. <coughs> you cannot estimate, estimation is almost impossible because for estimating this kind of equation, you need the entire history of inputs. No, no data will provide you this. <coughs> so there's some kind of assumption needed. So 
value added model basically imposes a structure on the parameter a geometrically declining pattern of, for inputs in the more distant past. So whatever input you achieve in class 5 or class 1 is, is still important but the importance goes down as you move further and further. <coughs> so imposing this assumption <coughs> we finally get an equation which is achievement in grade G, any grade is <laughs> basically a function of input, the school input in that grade, individual and family